an influential that you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, because we, we always have, have problems with him. Sometimes he doesn't allow us on. So if you could, if we ever have problems again, Eddie, with, uh, with Mark Zuckerberg, if you could just tell him that Max and Beanstalk want to go live, if you could make that phone call, send him that WhatsApp, that, Eddie, that would be great. Absolutely. We're pals. I'll, I'll text one of his three phones. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I bet none of them are iPhones. <laughs> right, Eddie, should we get should we get on with this? Should we introduce you to the world? Let's do it. We'll introduce you to, to our world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to myself, Max McGillivray, editor in chief of Beanstalk at Global. We have a Eddie, I've got to call you amazing because you are. If you look at Eddie's background and everything that he's achieved and everything that he's looking to achieve, he, he's a he's a bit like a reading a good book, but you're only a third of the way through it. You're already entranced. <laughs> as to what, what you've already read, but there's more to come. And that's why we were really keen to gauge with, engage with Eddie because we all want to watch him, and especially around the subject that we're going to talk about, which is, which is vertical farming and how it's potentially going to save our broken food system. Eddie, say hello to everyone. Well, hello. Um, I, I think it's uh, in, in, our, in our part of the world, it's a good morning, but to y'all, it's a good afternoon. And, and by the time uh, this is streamed and then, and then recorded, who knows what time it is, but exactly. good day. Good, good day. day, good day to you all, good day. And we're yeah. live onto Facebook, live onto LinkedIn. And if you're watching on the records on that YouTube and the podcast, hello. And especially for those people on the podcast, let's give a, a, a bit of background so we can really get into the nuts and bolts um, about this. Um, in our ever increasing and highly regarded interview series, 20 on 20, 20 minutes with inspirational people from the international food, food sectors, we're delighted to be joined by Eddie Badrina, CEO of Eden Green Technology from the USA. Over the past 20 years, Eddie's career has encompassed entrepreneurial, corporate and governmental roles. In 2019, Eddie took over as CEO of Eden Green Technology, which through its vertical farming technology stack is changing the way they farm and hopefully we farm our produce and feed our communities. Since then, retailers, researchers, cities and governments have discovered how Eden Green's technology turnkey solutions can help them establish food safety, food independence and sustainability farming unlike any previous ag tech solution. Outside of his leadership position at Eden Green, he is a board member at Seed Effect, a micro lending nonprofit focus on fostering economic stability. And Eddie is incredibly passionate about food security. And from a US perspective, we're gonna dive into a conversation about, I'm just, gonna, just gonna nominate these titles and see if Eddie and I can stick to them as well. Four ways local vertical farming and hydroponics can save our broken food system. How vertical greenhouses reduce energy costs, the rise of ag tech, how it's transforming the American farming landscape and how 1.5 acres can change an entire community. Eddie, have I done justice? Yeah, if we can cover all of that in 20 minutes, you are going to be amazing. Oh, wait, amazing. Don't, don't, don't worry, we've never, we've never ever done anything in 20 minutes. I don't, okay, I don't even know why we called it 20 minutes. Imagine <laughs> we, we'd have to have to race at that one. So, so we were just talking in our, in our green room about um, how vertical farming, that whenever we place anything up on our feeds about vertical farming, we see this huge spike of, of interest and it is it is fascinating especially for those like like myself and my colleagues who've been in agriculture and fresh food fresh produce for, for a number of years that we sort of still can't get our head around why there's so much interest about vertical farming when we've been basically growing things for, for millennia and, and what, what eddie what do you think is the attraction about about vertical farming about hydroponics that gets people so excited what do you think I think one, it's just sheer technology, right? People, okay. uh, it, it's a bit out of uh, of a movie when they see some of these photos of, you know, these huge uh, warehouses full of lights and then greens in them. Uh, I think the other thing too is is just the the realities of the environmental changes that uh, that we're seeing, and people understanding and starting to uh, realize where their produce is coming from, where their food's coming from, and what that's causing to the environment around them. Uh, and I think the, the, the last thing is, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's a, it's a rise in, we've seen here in the United States, a 400% increase in the rise of interest for locally grown foods. And so, uh, and so I think that lends itself to, again, to the last point of people want to know where their food's coming from. And so, uh, you combine all those together and, uh, and it's just this massively, massively fascinating, uh, part of the industry uh, that that the normal consumer is trying to you know starting to raise their eyebrows at and, and really wondering is this real? 
it, it, it's, it's amazing, especially when you think of the the, the nature of, of the United States, because you're basically four countries all, all sandwiched together. Well, so if you look yeah. at the, the, the UK, we're, we're 72 million people on, on an island. Mm -hmm. um, and, and But we're, we're very concerned about the likes of um, food miles in, in the UK, and especially with... Uh, Eddie, did you hear about our Brexit? Did you, did you hear that we, we decided I, that I, we did I heard, I heard a, there was an article or two about it, oh, right? Yeah. Well, we decided we didn't like our neighbours across. Yeah. So, so we we shut all the doors and, and kicked everyone out that we decided was. And, but there, there's um, eighty percent of our salad um, uh, consumption is imported in, and mm -hmm. as we're going through the Brexit process, there's been a huge drive for more um, UK production. So, on a similar sort of basis to the way that you've intimated, where I'm sat in stood in Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk. So, if you think of London, we're um, an hour northeast of uh, of London. A mile north of me, there's um, uh, there's a massive um, greenhouse build that was built over the, um, the, the the lockdown period, which is the size size of a very large football stadium to grow uh, cucumbers and peppers. Mm. Um, and and the technology is amazing because it uses w waste treated sewage from our local sewage plant that is pumped up to site. And there's seven Italian uh, heat extractor units take the the heat out of it. There's a ten degree heat differ differential. That heat is then used to, to grow the, the salad cropping. And then wow. the cooled um, uh, uh, human poo is then pumped back down to the station and then put into the water courses. It's all uh, it's all treated. But because there's, um, the heat differential is taken out, it doesn't cause the environmental um, problems. And not only did they build one site, they built two sites um, over the, um, the lockdown period. And they got plans potentially for another 20 or 25 sites within, within the UK. So yeah, I, I get about the, the, the food technology. So, so coming to um, the, the uh, America, um, to us, um, um, uh, British, uh, America's all about scale. So, so you're, you're actually seeing that there's this, this, there's a drive for that local production rather than having massive warehouses, massive feedlots for, for say, the likes of beef. That, that it's that that movement is actually taking it that way, is it? Yes, it is. So, just to give you an indication about where the U.S., uh, how our produce is shipped, uh, ninety percent of all lettuce. So, this is just lettuce, which yep. Americans eat like 5 billion pounds of 90% of all lettuce is grown out of one Valley in California. Wow. And it, it, think about that. So then to ship, so the vast majority of it is shipped to ship it to Texas, to ship it to Chicago is, you know, 2000 miles, 1500 oh, miles. And then yep. to ship it across all the way across the U S uh, you know, is, is, is miles and days. Right. Yep. And so, uh, to have 90% of produce of lettuce coming out of that one valley in California on the West Coast, and then 25% of all produce comes out of the Central Valley of California. So uh, it is, there are some significant food miles and supply chain issues uh, on our most basic of, uh, of, of food, right? So that, so when you can imagine, expand that out to all the other, uh, all the other produce whether it's cucumbers, right? Like you yep. said, or, oh, or no, no. tomatoes or uh, all of those, uh, you, you get to start to get a sense of how stretched out our supply chain is. Yep. And then you combine that with here in the United States uh, because of just uh, the, the pandemic and then what's been done uh, to the labor force uh, in terms of giving them you know, uh, 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 subsidies and uh, just helping people uh, get through the pandemic, we're seeing a drop uh, in, in labor supply or, you know, conversely or inversely arising. There's a labor shortage. Yeah. Well, no one, we have so many trucking issues now of people just not wanting to drive trucks yeah. or people not wanting to be in the fields. Yeah. Right. And so in the Salinas Valley where, where this lettuce is produced, uh, they're worried about water as they should be yeah. because they're going through a drought right now. Uh, they're worried about labor because they have less uh, migrant labor to go up and down with the harvests. Yeah. But the thing that they're most worried about, if you can imagine above those two, which are very worrying to me, the thing they're most worried about is transportation and logistics. Yep. They're seeing okay. a three to 400% increase in the cost of transportation and logistics. And you and I both know in a penny industry like lettuce well or arugula or spinach or any of those other things, a 400% increase, three to 400% increase in transportation wipes out any sort of margin yeah. that you have. Okay, well, well done, Eddie. You, you have described that 
that's so so well because I, I think where, where we are culturally different in the, in the uk in europe we don't have as that we don't have the food mart issue as much as you do but we definitely do have exactly the same issues around labor and mm-hmm. around around haulage so we've all got those, those similar issues so your that your proverbial magic one is to rather than have the the lettuce or the two or the tomatoes and cucumbers truck two thousand miles um, across countries to actually have sites in the the um and and the conurbations that actually need need the, need the produce is is that the magic one solution? That is, you know, we want we are customer centric, so we want to be where the customer is, and if the customer is in. Uh, you know, urban populations, major urban populations, we want to be in and around there. Yep. Now, you know, we talked in the green room about, okay, how do you get there, right? Land prices, um, you know, just the economics of it, we're seeing, uh, you know, our peers uh, located in some very curious places within cities, and you're wondering how the economics work on that. And everyone is wondering that too. <clears throat> and I think yep. the, the dirty secret is, um, a lot of these indoor farms that are technologically advanced are uh, capital intensive yep. uh, and they're operational, you know, operational expense e- intensive and they just, there's no profitability in sight for them. It's just yep. a land grab right now. And, and it's a bit like the, you know, the, the internet uh, boom of 2007, right? Yep. I think there's a land grab and then yep. we're all already seeing signs that, uh, investors uh, are are sort of waking up and seeing, okay, this is, all those projections were really rosy. Yep. Where's the real profitability coming from? Like where, you know, are these, are these projections actually uh, real and doable and attainable? And yeah. the answer for a Ed, lot of them Ed, is- Eddie, no. Eddie, I like you, you're, you're so real. Do, do you know, I, for some reason, I'm, I, was a bit, I was a bit concerned that we would be going off in diff, different tangents, but, but you, you're so realistic as to where, your your sector is and um, last night you very liked you very kindly liked to post that uh, uh, myself and a and a contact were, were were looking at about there's a there's a major business out your way who's just had um, a, a a major funding um, scenario dry, dry up on them and and yeah. just coming back back to the UK there's been um, we we've seen a, a rush um, with, with my recruitment background of companies coming into the likes of London. Um, and getting uh, three, four, five million pounds worth of funding to set up a vertical farm. And, and Eddie, the, their point of difference is, is that they're going to deliver the, the high-end salads and, um, and herb cropping to the high-end restaurants by electric car, electric scooter. Um, but the, the site that they've got is in the square mile, the most expensive um, expensive um, uh, uh, property prices in, in some of Europe, if, if not the world. And they're looking to grow, to grow lettuce. So when they've come to us, they said that as not not only do they want to supply these high end restaurants, they they are assuming that the retailers, our UK uh, retailers, will be banging on their door. And then when when I've looked to exacerbate their their um, their pain even further without realizing that they're they're under pain, um, and I say to well, what sort of margin do you think you're going to get from from a retailer? And they said, well, we think we we sh- we should with a decent brand get forty percent margin by serving oh. a by by serving a retailer. And then you then have to walk them back, and they're quite horrified that um, um, of these figures. But you would have thought they would have done the the due, due diligence. So in so in parallel, we've seen this the same thing. A lot of naivety about setting up very expensive um, units with lots of people uh, from the um, uh, from from the finance community thinking that this is an unsophisticated space and it's going to be. Uh, an easy route and it's going to be exciting and it's going to help help the sector but there's so many pitfalls um, along 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 the way so so eddie what let's talk what 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 well let's let's go for the question four ways local vertical farming and hydroponics could save our broken food system so we've got this um the, this desire to to grow more 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 locally we it feels like Eddie, you and I and our, our, our networks need to educate people um, through your expertise, your understanding as to how we can actually break the broken food system. How, how are we going to do it? So I think uh, the first way is uh, being, we have to create ways that are, uh, to what you were saying, economically viable, not just for uh, high-end restaurants, but for the vast majority of people, the folks who are have two or three kids and they're coming home from work well really tired and they just need nutritious greens, yep. right? Well um, so, so one, we have to make it accessible to them, financially accessible. 
two, it has to be consistent, right? Um, the, the, the broken food system, somehow we have to go and make it to where people can uh, access these 24 seven, 12 months out of the year, right? Yeah. Uh, seasonality for the, for the 21st century consumer, seasonality is out the window for them. <laughs> yeah. If I told my wife today that we could not buy strawberries because it wasn't in season, we would have major issues in our marriage. Major issues, right? yeah. okay. Major. Um, so, you know, consistency, accessibility. And then the third thing, which a lot of people look over, uh, overlook until it's hitting them in the stomach, unfortunately, is food safety, right? Yeah. Uh, we've had, because of the pandemic and because of these really exacerbated supply chains, uh, a lot of the, the suppliers and producers have cut corners here in the States. And not just in the greens, but in meat and, you know, yeah. dairy. And we're seeing a rise in, E. coli and salmonella outbreaks uh, because they're just trying to get stuff into this really bottleneck system, right? Uh, and then, and because of the bottleneck system, then things go bad because they've spent so long in the supply chain, right? So there's a lot more waste out there. Um, so, you know, consistency, accessibility, and food safety, those are all solved through the fourth one, which is locality. Uh, there, there are, um, really well-meaning, and I know a number of them, and, and we used to partake of them, but really well-meaning community gardens that are popping up around here, around the states in urban areas. Um, they supply some amazing greens, a uh, couple of problems. One is they're not scalable, yep. right? They can't feed you know, uh, the, the community at large. It's yep. only for their little neighborhood. And then the, the second one, it goes back to accessibility, I can, me and my wife and my kids, we have, we can afford to, we have the luxury, the time luxury of going to a farmer's market on the weekend. Okay. A lot of our neighbors do not. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So uh, that I think, you know, you, you have to solve for all four of those. And then the umbrella is it has to be like economically sustainable. So it's got to be profitable to last not just a year from now or two years from now, but 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you have to almost create uh, an infrastructure, a new infrastructure of produce and of food uh, to supply you know, what, what we're going through, especially post-pandemic. Yeah. Eddie, are we talking about a reset? I, I, and, and, on, I, and on the back, back of everything that we've all gone through the pandemic and the COVID, it isn't, isn't now the, the, the time to bring in a reset? Are we talking about a reset? I do, I, I do think, think we are. And, you know, the pandemic, I like to say that the pandemic didn't necessarily bring about any new trends. It just amplified all the existing trends. Yeah, well said. Right. And so, uh, so the move towards locally grown, the move towards uh, higher uh, intake of uh, vegetables and produce, not just as primaries, but also as just like ingredients within the impossible meats, right? Or uh, a lot of the ve vegetarian and gluten-free options that are on the rise. Um, those, those were all accelerated by the pan pandemic because like you said uh, in the green room, people during the pandemic wanted to eat more and clean more. And if you're in any of those two industries, you're golden, yeah. right? Well, yeah, they yeah, want to yeah. eat more, right? And yeah. they want to eat more at home. Yeah. So I, I think I do think it is it's require it's requiring a reset uh, only because the consumer is demanding it. And I think at the end of the day, that's that's where we're trying to be, you know, uh, consumer centric, where I think a lot of these technologists are coming into the space and they have no clue about either the consumer or the customer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All of our friends in the ag industry, not in the ag industry, but in the produce industry, in the supply chain industry are looking at these technologists and going, you have no clue what you're stepping into. Like you just think that you're gonna supply really beautiful greens locally and that people are gonna buy them at $11 a pound, right? Yeah. We literally had one distributor of ours and in the States here, lettuce, um, actually kale is you know around $3 a pound roughly. Okay. Uh, one, of the, one of these vertical farming, and I won't mention the name, literally said, Hey, here's our, our price for kale is $11 a pound. And they get you, you, I don't even know what to make of that Max. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so 
diff, it's just so disparate from from the realities of our our food industry. And, so and and, and, and Eddie, we're, we're completely we're completely in parallel because we're seeing exactly the same here in the UK and and Europe that the, these uh, uh, people, well-meaning people, think think that they can create their own little uh, food food little large food re revolution, uh, but they'll be able to um, get, gain a, a, a massive margin for it. Not, yeah, not it's it's it it they're not thinking big enough. They're thinking, can we supply high-end restaurants and yeah. hospitality groups? And that's well great. Okay. Yeah. What about the other 99% of the world, right? Absolutely. So, you know, are the inventors of our tech who are from South Africa, uh, they invented it in South Africa in 2010 and, and proceeded to spend about seven years of really developing it. Yeah. But they came at it from a totally different perspective in that they were looking at efficiency first. They knew they had to be scrappy. They had to be resourceful in order to make something that would actually, um, you know, be, be viable in South Africa. They took it to yeah. the United States because there's more chances for commercial uh, commercialization and expansion. But the, but the reality is we've come from, our technology comes from a totally different base than a lot of our peers in that they started with very few dollars or rands and they, they proceeded to make it very efficiently. So efficiency and profitability is our driving metric, yeah. right? Yeah. Besides, and, and then obviously it waterfalls from there yeah. to pounds per square foot. Yeah. Whereas a lot of our peers, not all of them, but a lot of them came from, let's just create, let's just throw a ton of money at creating the best tech. Yeah. And yeah. then we'll figure out the, the efficiencies later, right? Yeah, yeah. They took a, a you know, they took a Facebook approach or they took a, a Silicon Valley approach, which is let's just create the best tech and then we'll monetize it later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they tried to apply that industry into where we're currently at with our ag industry and it just doesn't make sense. And, and that's why we need inspired, inspirational people like you, Eddie. I, I think I, I, the example I, I give is the, it's a bit of a, um, a morbid one, but it, there's a reason for, for mentioning it. It's the, it's the plane crash analogy that there was a, I think it was Swiss Air oh, about 10 years ago. Um, uh, it was flying 32,000 foot um, and smoke entered the cabin. And so they got out the, um, the, uh, the, the book um, as to what to do in, in an emergency. And they start that the, the pilot and the co-pilot started reading. Um, and it was uh, apparently it was 25 pages long as to what to do in, the, in an emergency. And they uh, all got consumed by, 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 by this inhaling the smoke. And you can guess the, guess the inevitable. Um, when the pilots got, got uh, the pilots union and, and the Europe got, got involved, and uh, they said, well, what, who wrote, who wrote this, this, this manual? It was obviously See the software people or the or the engine manufacturers. The first thing they should have done was to just to get the plane down and and to, to a level where they could have vented everything. Um, who wrote the manual? This, this is this is wrong. And it's a bit like when you get some uh, uh, website uh, editors or developers to do the front end of a, of a website. They 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 set it up um, as if they would want it um, as highly intelligent people, but not for the for the likes of me to be able to navigate around we, we need sensible people to to lay out the strategic direction for this otherwise you get over complicated businesses which which eddie do you think we're, we're in now with with the, with the likes of the vertical farming scenarios and these massive units that you've got your end and we've got our, our end when actually going on the localized basis that you're mentioning with the yeah. technology that you've got it is the way to go yeah you know we've we've proven our technology based on the economics of it so uh from the very get-go we've tried to to uh, and we continue to improve on our greenhouses as being economic units unto themselves, right? Uh, and so where we've landed now is uh, the the most unlikely of investors, real estate investors have taken uh, and infrastructure investors have taken uh, taken an eye to us because they're wow. looking at at our greenhouses as a new asset class within real estate or infrastructure. Okay. It's you buy a piece of real estate that makes sense economically. Yeah. You put a cash flowing yeah. uh, cash flowing uh, entity on top of it. And then yeah. you watch your you watch your investments grow, right? Ed, Ed, Eddie, Eddie, are you like a modern day car park in, in that respect? I, you know, so that's interesting. You know, when, when we first uh, were trying to find analogies to help resonate with these real estate investors, the thing that came to mind is, in, you know, America is we're professional consumers, right? So we've got uh, we've got storage facilities, right? Uh, and they're in their concrete pads 
with you know just very rudimentary um they're not even sticks and bricks they're aluminum right yeah. uh yeah. or as you guys say aluminum aluminum right or aluminum no but carry on it's brilliant <laughs> steel right yeah. um but but they're they're storage facilities and you yeah. store your you store your extra stuff in there and uh, a lot of investors yeah. take these storage facilities and they're cash flowing very easily uh you know uh torn down and you and and then you can build something else on yeah, them yeah. Uh, but they invest in them because they're great ways to hold real estate. And while the real estate is appreciating over the yeah. long term, they're getting cash flow on the short term. So car parks, storage facilities, wow. that that's how we're honestly we're we're positioned. But you can't position yourself that way unless you can actually cash flow positively yeah. on the top end. And I'm a businessman first. Okay. So I, I'm as much as I want to cast this huge dream and vision, I, I can't do it in good conscience if it doesn't make financial sense for me. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest difference between us and a lot of our peers is yeah. we're, we're, we're on the profitability train, right? We want to cast a great vision mesh network of greenhouses, local greenhouses all across the United States yeah. and the world to where you can be nationally and globally local yeah. and be profitable. Yeah, Eddie, well, well done. Well done. I'm so, I'm so pleased we, we had this conversation. Um, three years ago, I better not name them. Three years ago, we had a conversation with a uh, vertical farming operation in uh, California that was well funded by by a bloke that's recently gone gone. Well, it's gone sixty miles to the moon. You, you, can, you can work out who, who that yeah. is. Um, and speaking to those individuals, it was like speaking to a cult um, that they they had a vision that within five years they would have fifty five significant sites globally growing um salad cropping on, on a vertical farming uh, basis and it was going to revolutionize the world and, and myself and my 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 business partner we were looking at each other over this conference call just feeling very uh cynical if, if being been honest a bit, a bit depressed um, because they just again going back to the naivety of the, that, that we talked about move on three years um that that business has uh, gained uh 350 million us of, of funding and it's only got two sites and those half a dozen people that we were talking to have all disappeared and gone on to the next cultish internet startup uh, within uh west coast america and all, all credit to, to them so it's, in, in effect it's failed and, and and it's a comment rather than a question where did all that money go let, let's let's not worry about that yeah. um, but absolutely that the direction of travel that they they've looked to operate is fundamentally wrong where you where you're talking in the respect of engaging with real estate and repurposing those buildings you can see that those buildings can just because there's a huge environmental cost in putting up buildings and ripping buildings down building new buildings if if you and your colleagues and your technology can come in and re repurpose them um and um at 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 as you said, we'll come on to it. 1.5 acres could change an entire community. And, and you've got that within the community and it's providing an everything as well as nutrition in, employment. Uh, what, what a way to go. What, what One question on, on that side, it's an important one that we're seeing this end, especially we, we've got huge um, energy. We've got an energy crisis in the, in the UK at the mo moment. Yeah. I won't men mention Brexit again. It, we'll blame the Russians this time. Um, and so th there's a lot of uh, vertical farms who... Are, are struggling and we're hearing that that some uh, might actually have to back back production because um of the huge electricity cost especially if they haven't locked it in Absolutely. Um, are, are, are you are you, you going to suffer the, the the same issues of these bigger units with your smaller units um or or, or what, what, what's your view about how you can reduce energy costs uh, per, yeah. per se using your tech so so our technology is actually we've combined the best of vertical farming with greenhouses so our technology works the best and is the most economically efficient in a greenhouse. And that's how we've, uh, that's how we've really uh, have proposed our expansion. Ed, right? Ed, are you talking about using the sun? R rather imagine than, rather... that, imagine, imagine that using free energy. Who came right? up with that? Eddie, who came up with that idea? It's like revolutionary. Know. Whoever it is was brilliant. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, the reality is uh, we, we need supplemental lighting as well, but when yep. we're growing in a greenhouse and the way our technology is designed is, is absolutely brilliant in that we can use a lot of the sunlight that comes into a, a 24 foot greenhouse. Uh, the, the reality is we only need lighting for an acre and a half. Whereas in a greenhouse, in a flat tray hydroponic greenhouse, 
So just to give you some, some uh, yes. So in indoor farming, it's just flat tray upon flat tray upon flat tray. And it's all lights, all lights. And each of those lights are so expensive to buy and they're so expensive to operate. Yeah. In a flat tray greenhouse where it's just one level, um, <clears throat> the problem is you still need a lot of surface area, right? So an acre and a half of ours is equal to 10 acres of a greenhouse, which is equal to 40 acres of traditional farming. Yep. Right. Okay. Well, guess what? For a 10 acre greenhouse, you still need to cover that 10 acres in lights and yep. run it that way. Yep. We only have an acre and a half of lights. So do we use light electricity? Absolutely. Uh, but do we use it very efficiently over an acre and a half instead of 10 or more? Uh, Absolutely. Right. We just, we, we use so much less light, probably uh, on the order of a 10th less light than your, your indoor farms and about a fifth less light than your greenhouse, uh, wow. your hydroponic greenhouses. Excellent. So and, and, that, and, that is, and, that makes our, again, we've got to be economically viable. And Eddie, just, just for, for my friend, Malcolm, who, who listens to our podcast whilst walking his dog, just, just visually um, um, paint, paint the picture as to yeah. if, if you if, if we were going to hold figuratively hold your hand and you're going to walk us through one of your units what does it actually look like can you just walk us through that please absolutely so if you can close your eyes and envision a 24 foot greenhouse right and uh in these this greenhouse there are hundreds of rows 18 foot walls of greens if you will uh that uh, are spaced probably six feet apart right maybe even a little uh, a little more uh, but these 18 foot walls that span the length, the width of the greenhouse, they're actually made up of towers. So uh, each of these towers, uh, they've, got, uh, they've got plants on either side. So they've got grow spots on either side uh, and there's 36 grow spots per tower, right? So, uh, so in, a, in an acre and a half greenhouse, you have 300,000 spots, plant spots. And in those 300,000 plant spots, uh, you can grow because you plant, we have what's called a perpetual harvest, right? So if you plant two or three rows a day, then you go plant the next one day, the next one, by the time you get all the way down to the greenhouse, it's time to harvest these three first three ones that you planted. So yep. in our greenhouses, there's always some aspect of harvesting and yep. planting yep. and cleaning going on. So you have a perpetual harvest. So those 300,000 plant spots uh, will go through 11 to 13 harvests a year per plant spot and in a perpetual basis. Excellent. So you're spitting out, you know, uh, a little under 2 million pounds uh, of leafy greens per year in a perpetual manner. Yep. Excellent. Okay. And then the, uh, the, the, the technology or the, or the labor requirements, um, it, is, is this all done by hand, the, the planting and the, and the harvesting or robotics or a combination of? Or So there's a combination of, so uh, again, we wanted to be really efficient and focus on the technology. So imagine this, you've got an acre and a half greenhouse, 300,000 plant spots, uh, you know, the totally profitable well, in that profitability, in that PL, we actually account for 30 full-time people. Okay. And okay. it's and it's because we're so efficient. So these people are planting, yeah. they're monitoring, they're harvesting, they're cleaning, right? Um, the 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 dirty secret about automation is it costs money. Oh. <laughs> right. Imagine that. So if people say, well, we do robotics. And when the reason they do robotics, it's, it's a bit of in the U S we say it's lipstick on a pig. Right. Uh, but, but you do robotics because people can't move these huge trays back and forth, but all they're really doing is moving a tray, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? There's yeah. nothing really magical about it. They're just moving trays. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So your robotics though costs money. So when people say, well, we have robotics and it's automated, they're doing that because their OPEX is already so high because of lights yeah. that they have to find efficiencies in the operating expenses. Wow, okay. So they put in robotics, but then that bumps up their CapEx. Yep. Then it's just a longer return on investment, right? Your right, timeline right. gets farther and farther out. Yeah. Well, yeah. They're, not, they're not concerned about ROI like we are. Yeah. So yeah. 
a lot of our stuff is manual right now. The growing is actually automated and AI enhanced to help yeah. grow and optimize uh, nutrient mix and water Excellent. temperature and lighting, right? All the lumels that get to it in, a, yeah. uh, in the course of a day. Uh, but a lot of the things that we're doing right now uh, are are uh, are manual because we can, yeah. because we do want to employ people. So Max, you know, if we're so located, awesome. if we're located in an urban area, yeah. and really strategically, at least here in the United States, the best place to put these greenhouses are in uh, underserved communities because the underserved communities for for a number of reasons are actually really great strategic distribution points. Yep. They've just been underserved because of infrastructure. Yeah. Well, if yep. you put one of these acreage, you know, acre and a half modules there and you're putting it in an underserved community, who do you want to employ? Yep. Your neighbors. Yep, absolutely. Right? So why would I want to put something that's so capital intensive heavy when I already have the margins there, when I could be benefiting the neighbors around us and having them work there, yeah. you know, it, it's, we're, we're not just interested in the profit, yeah, yeah. Oh. but because we are efficient and profit from the, from the foundation of our, uh, of our company, we're focused on efficiency and we're focused on profitability. It allows us to be beneficial and generous to our neighbors by employing them, by putting these things within their midst so that they can, you know, we actually in our PL, we have, you can actually give, you know, anywhere from five to 10% away of, of your greens away to the community around you. Excellent. Yeah. Right. What, Eddie, do you remember what the, uh, what, what the, the statement was, the mission statement of Google when it first started? Do no harm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And Don't all, be evil. All, or, or I was going to spin it around the other way. Uh, do good, and and you look at yeah. what you're you're doing. You've got this lovely virtuous circle of um, growing uh, fantastic fresh fresh produce, employing locally, giving locally, and this lovely virtuous circle and the, and the health benefits as well as the econ economic benefits. Just just go back to that bit about uh, robotics because it does does make me um, uh, snigger, uh, laugh, laugh a little bit. So, so, so one of my clients calls it um, handrolics. Handrolics. That it, we're five years off um, technology coming along that can identify um, a, a raspberry or an apple and to put, pull it off. And there's nothing wrong with employing good labor for all the reasons that we've um, what, what that we discussed about. Um, this particular client, he he he. Um, operates a, a very large soft fruit business in the in the UK, and they uh, were employing 1,200 people to pick. And when he got into it, he realised that actually what they didn't need was some quarter of a million US or sterling um, a robot to pick the fruit. Uh, where the inefficiencies were, were getting trays to 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 the pickers, and it was that whole supply chain that I, I use, use a statement on going. There's so much profitability held up within the supply chain, and I actually think. I normally mean that about um, freight, but he actually meant it within uh, just basic things, making sure that every every element was fed. He got involved and um, from the 1200 um, people, they managed to reduce it down to 600 people in one season and got a 25% increase of efficiency because they just bossed the systems properly. And he was he was really surprised within this particular unit, which I think does happen across a lot of the UK that there's there's so much more efficiencies that could be brought um, into the into the units and in, into the farms, and I'm I'm just going to assume that you you've already you've already bossed that, so you don't you don't need to um, get get uh, someone involved to um, have a robot um, to, to to pick when you've already got these efficiencies and you want to employ uh, people and you want to do good um, as you've intimated in those local communities and, and crikey if you can extrapolate that what, what's what's the realistic dream in five years time how many of your units do you want in the states so in five years time in the states uh we will we will probably have upwards of uh 50 greenhouses get out which are of actually town. Actually, about a hundred greenhouse modules. So we wow. we do them in twos. <laughs> we call them double wides, but uh, but they're basically in twos. So 100, 125,000 square feet of grow space. Um, so we'll have fifty of those uh, in all ma major MSAs, uh, metropolitan areas. Uh, in yeah, in that time. So, so did, did, we got this. Uh, got this. This title of the rise of ag tech how it's tra transforming the american farming landscape so with what with your solution um is that taking the best of both the, the best of, of labor and the best of the the the, the ag tech in the way of the growing um information data um uh, seed houses that, that are going to get involved it, it's 
is that where you're looking at it with your colleagues that you can create um, that this change with with ag tech, but using stuff that that's uh, that that we've used time and memorial like the sun and like right. good labor. Yeah, I you know we 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 do think it's a uh, it we we don't we just we want to be efficient where we need to be efficient and automated where we need to be automated. Uh, but at the end of the day, it comes down to th there's a human touch in planting and farming that I think is overlooked, right? Uh, and, and, and I think we really want to include that. Uh, there's no reason we can't include that. The only reason we wouldn't include that is because if we were trying to wring out every last piece of profitability out there at yeah. the expense of capital, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I, we just don't see it that way. Yep. Right. We also don't th see that we're the silver bullet. I think there are going to be a number of winners in our space, uh, you know, when it comes to being more efficient producers of, uh, uh, or more, more efficient growers and suppliers of produce. Uh, yeah. We don't think we're the only ones, but we do think we're, we are leading the way in terms of thinking about uh, profitability first and thinking yeah. about the consumer and about the community around us first, yeah. uh, because we know at the end of the day, that that's going to be the best thing for our community at large. Yeah, well, well said. And just going back to the your 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 technology being of South African um, heritage, I, I remember when um, I was in the Hex River Valley in South Africa, one of the best regions for for growing uh, grapes there globally. Was with this amazing grower, and we're just looking at these uh, these, these amazing uh, white grapes. And he got hold of a, of a bunch. He said, "Max, when you go back to the, the UK and you go and see." Uh, the school kids who are following you or, or um, uh, when you're doing uh, uh, study tours and things, just tell them that we grow sunshine. We grow sunshine. Mm -hmm. and, that, and Eddie, that's what you do. You grow, grow, grow sunshine. Rather than having a, a closed building uh, with people wrapped up in uh, condom suits um, and with, with the <laughs> UV, UV lights, you, if you, if, crikey, if you're going to have 50 units and the change that you're going to make to all of those centres of, of populace, Growing such amazing produce using sunlight, you, yeah, you, you you grow sunlight and and uh, and, a, and a little bit more on on the back of that. So you're right. absolutely so you're absolutely convinced. I'm going to lead the witness. You're absolutely convinced that 1.5 acres um, on on a on a standard basis can change co communities yeah. on on that on that basis. So uh, one, I'm not only absolutely convinced. Two, I think it's much much bigger than even our, even my mind can comprehend because here's why 50 greenhouse modules or 50 greenhouses of ours, guess how much lettuce that covers in the United States lettuce consumption. Okay. Like just, just guess a percentage. Uh, 50, it can't, wait, you've got, you've got 250 million souls. So it can't, it can't be, it can't be anything. It's got, three, it's got three percent, three percent. I was going to go for like 0.001%. 3%, okay. 3%, if you can imagine that, like we would have a hundred of our greenhouses, you know, wow. uh, 50, 50 of those double wides, a hundred of our greenhouse modules will only cover 3% of okay. just lettuce. Wow. It's not including all the other things we can grow like arugula and kale and spinach yeah. and herbs. And, you know, it, that's just lettuce. Yeah. So I, I really do think, uh, it is, we've just scratched the surface uh, yeah. by, uh, by addressing the, the needs of the basic, the, the normal consumer. Let the high end beat the high end, yeah. go for it. Yeah. I want to address the normal everyday consumer who just wants nutritious greens and produce for them and their families. And, and not traveling 2,000 miles um, not across, traveling 2, miles. across the California and uh, sorry for the motive time, term sorry for the motive term basically raping california of soil fertility and 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 that water usage um and, and providing no benefit to, to to a local community yeah just but do, just with, with my agricultural background i remember um when i was at ag um U university we we had a lecturer who used to state that um in europe there were certain areas that were good at growing things scotland mm -hmm. always rains and lots of uh, lovely lush grass so stick all the cattle up there um, to the east of England, it's a, a lovely land, and it's, it's very good for grain, um, milling wheat for bread and barley for for, for beer. Uh, then you go into into Europe and France, very good for grapes and um, and but this is 
Uh, and like in the in the UK, we we grow um, sugar beet, but it's not very efficient. If you go to somewhere like South Africa, as I'm sure you go, right. go there, there's um, it is such a good place to to grow um, to grow sugar beet. It feels like we are in this broken food system, um, and especially within within America. And I suppose it's there's a lot of big businesses, big uh, corporate food businesses um, that that are just driving this relentless growth um of the the, the salad cropping and, and the likes of california are, are, are you are you anticipating or have you already hit hurdles where uh companies individuals don't want you to prosper uh I, I wouldn't say that uh i would say so so in our industry i think you know speaking frankly you've got farmers and ag industry veterans on one side and you've got technologists on the other and these technologists are coming in with this great new tech or you know whatever it is having no clue of how this thing operates yeah and on this side you've got you know on the ag industry side and the farmer side uh you've got people who've done it the way they've always done it but they know they need to change and so we're we're where a lot of technologists are coming in and trying to you know being bulls in a china shop we're actually coming in on the sides of growers and farmers and saying, wow. hey, we want to come alongside you. Yeah. And we know we can't grow wheat in ours. We know we can't grow some of the you know woody stemmed bushes and other types of produce. Here's what we're really good at, right? And here's what we're not good at. And we're not going to be to try to be everything to everyone, but we know we can be good at this and, and allow you to then grow other things on your land that are probably more profitable for you, yeah. right? Uh, and and you know are less susceptible to some are you know and less sensitive to some of the weather and seasonal patterns. Yeah, yeah. So let us do this really well, and let us actually be the growers' grower for y'all. Wow. Let us provide consistent growth of these greens yeah. so that you can focus on other things. And it's been very well received. Right. So, so Eddie, Eddie, the one word you're missing in all of that is collaboration. If, if there's one thing I've uh, learned over the last 80 months and 160 broadcasts, it's collaboration. Right. The more that we can collaborate in our broken food system, the better it's going to be. Because what, why should uh, yeah, that grower, if, if they can collaborate with you and assist you um, with your with your sites to grow, um, say, say lettuce on, on that basis, I'm going to have to show you my cabbage. You, you, unless you tell me otherwise, you, you won't be able to grow a cabbage uh, within your system at the moment, but that farmer can, and that's yeah. more applicable. So going back to my example, my ag lecturer is saying that there's certain areas of um, of, of land of, of countries that should grow certain mm -hmm. things. So if we can look at the broken food system, fix it with your system and get the farmers to grow what they actually probably want to grow and are, are better at growing, um, yeah. but they're still being remunerated because that, that financial system will be, will, will be fixed. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone wins, especially the consumer. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, collaboration gets such a, it's, it's such a, a high minded, it's kind of an ephemeral wor word to a lot of folks, but really what it comes down to is, Hey, it's like Adam Smith's competitive, you know, it's, it's the competitive advantage. Let, let us be, let us uh, allow you farmers to, to have your competitive advantage and we'll have ours yeah. for the benefit of the consumer. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And so again, like, I think we're coming from a totally different place than a lot of our peers. Uh, so we haven't received a lot of the pushback that our peers well, have uh, only because we're, we're coming alongside the farmer and saying, Hey, yeah. We, we can we know we can do this better and we know we can't do x y and z better yeah right? yeah well, well again well well said because we know of a number of uh, uh vertical farming businesses if you looked at eight not alienate but they just 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 disregarded centuries of growing expertise by farmers because they they think they've got the intelligence to do it better going back to my um air aircraft analogy and, and and just to throw some figures out there, especially for those on, on the podcast, um, I always remember this quote from Rabobank, so D Dutch um, yeah. um, ag agricultural bank, but on, working Absolutely. on a global basis. And one of their key representatives in November 2019 stated that 90% of the people in vertical farming will not be in it in three years' time because they will run out of money. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, um, Eddie goes back to that naivety sounds too strong a word but the, the 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 thought that they can come into this sector and create dominance when it's it's not like that and also um if you look at in the states alone of the circa 1.5 billion us in investment money um in vertical farming space um added up um there is 
only 100 million US in total sales. So, so um, 1.5 billion in investment and only 100 million in, in total sales. Um, and then, then you come along. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to, 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 to fix it guys you're all doing it wrong come come over here watch this take take take, take a lesson lesson from us so say so, so the future you've already intimated as to where you, you think your system can can be um eddie how can we help how can we help with our networks to so the people that are dialed in from the uk europe and and internationally um how can they help you and your colleagues um create this change accelerate this 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 change for you how can we help I mean, what I think, I think being uh, just exploring us more, educating yourselves on like, hey, wh what are the realities of this industry, and and exploring like, hey, are, are I want people to challenge me. Hey, can you really do what you say you can do? Are you really, you know, is Excellent. is is profitability really, you know, really a, a is profitability a reality for you, or are you just blowing smoke, right? Um, I think that's one of the best things to do is, is just to challenge us, look through our website, look through chat, challenge us and, and, you know, dive deep for more information. Uh, yeah. Because I think when people are more educated, they will make, they'll just make better decisions, yeah. Yeah. right? On, on where they're going to buy their food, how they're going to invest their money. Um, I would say, man, uh, explore, you know, start to think about greenhouses, start, start to think about uh, vertical farming as infrastructure, right? Instead of just produce, but start to think about it as infrastructure and then start to ask the questions of, okay, what, what type of infrastructure do we need to care for our, our communities? How does that infrastructure look? Where does it need to be? How can I invest in it? Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just be an advocate, not just for us, but uh, I think there's so much skepticism around, new innovation and technology coming into something as traditional as farming and yep. just to be advocates and saying, Hey, and be open-minded and say, Hey, if it, if it makes sense, if it's profitable, if it doesn't, you know, hurt our communities, can these things exist and can they actually help uh, our, you know, our resiliency as a community? Can they help uh, with global food production? Um, and can they help with the environment? Yeah. So having an open mind too, and, uh, and, and being curious about like, okay, uh, th this is, this is a traditional industry, but, but can this actually work, uh, yeah. and do the research on it? And I think the more that people educate themselves on the, on the, just the pros and the cons of vertical farming and of hydroponic greenhouses, uh, and then just even on ours specifically, I think the more they'll, they'll come to the conclusion where we are, which is this ought to and can be done. It just has to be done in a way that's economically and financially sustainable. Yeah. Well done. Uh, question, question in. Um, can you ask Eddie? Uh, you, you both talk about uh, collaboration. Uh, would Eddie be interested in collaborating uh, about bringing his model um, into the UK and Europe? Absolutely. We've already been in talks uh, with folks there in the UK and okay. would be absolutely uh, love to love to entertain a conversation about bringing it over there yeah and I'm, I'm not surprised that you're very very positive answer especially with the with the heritage of your technology from uh, from 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 south africa because if those founders managed to bootstrap the, the the technology in quite a difficult environment sometimes in, in south africa and make it work and and then then get it into the states there's there's no, no reason why it then, then can't go um across across globally is it, eddie it's going to be fascinating isn't it looking at this five ten years out to see um how how but i suppose this, this is just the way of, of business and technology Th some things work some things don't but all credit to everyone that's getting involved in this this sector that they're being curious and they're mm -hmm. investigating and everyone wants to do the same i think everyone knows that there's a there is a broken food system out there and, and you could argue that there's too many uh there are too many larger players out, out there when actually to create a an equalized um food system and perhaps better better lives for our communities we need more businesses like like yourselves rather than uh, dom dominant players but do, you, but do you think it's realistic can we uh, fix this broken food system in that five ten year, year period or are, are, are we blowing smoke what do you think no i think it's absolutely doable i think it's going to take a lot of different players because it's going to take large players it's going to take small players like us um, and, but I think it acts absolutely can be done on, on a global scale too. Right. And, and, and it's the small players matter, Max, because, 
there's a lot of geographic and economic differences uh, across the globe, right? And I'll give you a, a really good example. Um, we're, we've told folks, hey, the economics don't pencil. They don't pencil in for, for where you are, what your market is, okay. right? And what you need. It just, our, our greenhouses don't make sense. And we're, wow, we're happy to brave. say that. Hold on. We're happy to Hold say on. that, right? Because we don't want to be everything to everyone. If you have a lot of land available and you're not that worried about, um, about the supply chain or about you know, the food miles that we call here in the States, uh, then, then our greenhouses aren't for you. Because we're really, we are really focused on areas, geographic and economic areas where food miles do matter uh, and where land is at a premium. So, you know, even within, and people often point to the Middle East, right, as, oh, they could absolutely use your technology. So even within the Middle East, if they have a lot of land, uh, sand or otherwise, if they've got a lot of cheap land really close to the urban environment, they don't need our dense growing yeah. platform. They just build a ton of greenhouses yeah. and good for them, right? Yeah. And that's where your flat tray greenhouses are gonna thrive. But there are other uh, populations and geographic areas within that same region yeah. that are uh, land challenged, and that have a high density of population. And those are the folks that are looking at us and saying, yes, we need you because we don't have a ton of land for greenhouses. Yep. We actually need this to be in a very localized, dense piece yep. of land. And, and it makes the most sense. So yep. even within, uh, you know, you can't even blanket statement something like the Middle East about that could use, you know, that could use our, um, our specific type of, technology uh, because it, even within that you know they could they could easily get to a, a flat trade greenhouse and be yeah. economically profitable and I'd yep. say more power to them and, and you think of the urbanization that is that is that is going on um, just just um, you think of Africa that the 10 fastest mm -hmm. growing cities in, in the world are all in Africa and those those people all need feeding so you can see how your system your, your tech would work there let alone um a, a, a america south, south america um a, yeah. asia as well they, and then going back to the uae i just scratch my head sometimes in be bewilderment when you think of their dairy units they have five thousand head of cows uh five thousand head of cows milking dairy cows air conditioned Mm -hmm. um, and uh, having all of the the, the feed um, shipped in from thousands of, of miles away, just just because they want food security, and I, I get the food security element of it, but it's like why, why park a major city in, in a desert in the, in the first place if you've got to, but that, again again Eddie, that's that's a conversation for, for, for another time. So yes. so yes, with with the adoption of your your system. Um, and the more and more units that you roll out with the plan of, of having 50 in, in three, three to five years time and then looking on an international basis, it's it would, it, as we said, at the, right at the start, it's going to be it's going to be fascinating to watch you and, and the business and, and your colleagues. Can, can you just how do we find out about 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 your business, especially for those people on the podcast so they can quickly send, send a note or send them an email to themselves? What, what, what's the website? Where, where do they need to look, please? So edengreen.com, so E-D-E-N green.com. Uh, and then on the socials, we're everywhere at Eden Green Tech. Uh, yep. But you can find anything about us. Uh, in fact, our, our marketing team has done a really good job. I've, uh, very early on, I said, hey, we need to educate folks on what are hydroponics, what yep. is, well you know, what's vertical farming, all the basics. Yep. Uh, and so... Uh, Fortunately, a year and a half, two years later, you look at it. And if you look up hydroponics or vertical farming or anything of that nature, we tend to pop up. Um, so uh, it's just because we have a lot of content just on the basics of that stuff. So I would encourage folks to go to edengreen.com, not just to check us out, but then also to look at the content and, and educate yourselves on the, uh, on the industry as a whole. Eddie, thank you very much for your time. Before we wrap up, I have to ask you one question. What is your favorite fresh produce, please? Oh, favorite fresh produce, mango. Oh, love it. Love it. <laughs> I'm my, my parents are, are Filipino immigrants to the United States. And so uh, I grew up eating all the, all the tropical fruits in my home. And, and mango is something that brings back great memories of childhood. And, uh, and, I, and I still love it. 
fantastic and you, you stole you stole the show with that one thank you very much for your time everyone let's uh let's watch out for eddie and his um and his his colleagues it's it's a uh, as i said eddie's only a third of the way through his uh his, his book of his uh, of his life story if, if he and the, and the rest of his colleagues can create this this change in our broken food system uh we all need to to watch follow and adopt them and and get your systems over to the uk and uh, and europe and the, and the rest of the world eddie thank you very much for your time keep safe and we'll, we'll see you very shortly all right thanks so much max thank you bye bye bye, bye.